Hey, it's Carlanne, and I wanted to just touch base again. It's been a while since I left you a video about how I'm doing. And the reason I haven't done a video about how I'm doing is because I don't feel I'm doing very good. Um, so I have been seeing a grief counselor, which has uh, been really good. Uh, I would just like highly recommend anyone who's like grieving, whether it's a parent or a spouse or child or even a friend, I'd say it's really good to talk to someone who understands the grief process really well from sort of that objective side. Also people who've experienced it subjectively because there's things that happen and um, uh, you just don't even realize like, it, like this is normal. And so when someone says to me, oh, that's normal, you can expect that. Like, I'm like, oh my goodness, I hate this so much. I hate this grieving part. So uh, I'll just give you a little bit of an example of some of the things that I'm that I'm feeling as I grieve. And maybe you've experienced some of these things, or maybe you still are with other um, situations you've been in. And just helping to, I guess, normalize grief. We don't really talk about it a lot. And people who've been through it, um, they may have more grace and more sort of uh, patience with me. But one of the things is, is that the first month I thought, wow, I am doing so well. I felt like I could get out and do things and I was accomplishing things. I was staying on task with things. Um, the second month hit, things got a little harder, but by the end, I'm like, we're getting close to the end of the second month and I feel like things are getting harder. Um, I think what happens, and this is sort of what the counselors have told me and what I've read about grief, this is what I understand, is that the first bit, you know, you're, you're busy, you're, there's, on some hand, there's some relief. You know, I know where Scott is, he, he's not suffering anymore. On some level, there's relief. I know that he's okay now. Um, and, you know, there was people here for a long time and things were, Things are good. There's lots of stuff to keep me busy. So there was like go, go, go feelings and things to do. Um, not that there's not things to do now, but it's like now suddenly that numb, uh, disassociated feeling is starting to go. And it's like, wow, this is hard. It's hard to be alone again. And you begin to realize like there's a lot of parts of this person's life with me that is not here anymore. You know, special days come like Father's Day or birthdays or all those kinds of things. And, um, you know, you have an expectation, but you don't know, you have no clue. What should this expectation even be? Like never been here before. So you don't really know what to expect or what to do or what to plan. And at the same time, you're kind of walking around all the other people who've been in this loss together with you, not sure what do they need, what do I need, what do they need from me, how do we do all of this. So um, there's just so many unknowns. And so that just gets to be exhausting. And you're still, whole, I am still holding on to things like uh, there's still stuff that has to be done. You know, uh, unfortunately, every single person has a complete different journey. So we can't say this is what it's going to be like for anybody else, but this is what it's like for me. And can I get up and just push through and do it? Absolutely, I can. So, um, but what happens is I eventually just get so run out of capacity and energy that I feel like it takes me a couple of days to recover from pushing through as much as I feel like I need to some days. Um, I think if I was working at a job where I had to go out of the house every day, I think on one hand it would be easier because I'd have to do it. I'd have to like just push all of my grief away, push my feelings away and just get the job done and put on a happy face and just go. So on one hand, that'd be easier. And that honestly is much more my personality is just like to push through. Um, but I'm trying to be super healthy in this and actually do the grieving and do the work. And man, I have to be honest, I, I hate it. Uh, this idea of like sitting with the emotion and feeling it. Ah, 
don't like it. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do this well. The, what I'm hearing from others, like the counselors that I've seen and my doctor, they're like, yeah, you're actually doing this really well. And you're in a good space. You're sort of at like what we would expect to be a normal stage. So you're doing good. So people ask me, so like, how are you doing? And I'm like, well, according to the doctors, I'm doing good. How does this feel? It feels terrible. I hate this stage of grief. Um, I am struggling. Uh, and when I say that I'm struggling, what I mean by that is there are days that I don't want to leave my house, that I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to see people. I don't want to eat. Uh, I can't sleep. Uh, things that used to take like no thought or energy, like just clean up the kitchen. Uh, now it just is like a big heavy burden. I don't know if I have energy to take care of the kitchen or to clean up the dishes or, or make my bed. Although I do make my bed almost every day, but um, probably like two or three times I haven't made my bed. But I'm trying to put these like little things in place that I can get them done. And what I'm, what I'm realizing from others who've, who are telling me about their grief journey or from the counselors I've been seeing is that um, it's actually very, very common to not have capacity to do some of these basic things. And that lots of times what will happen is there's going to be big things that we have to get done and all the little stuff just never gets done, sometimes for a year or more. Well, I'm hoping I can get some of these things done before a year but uh at least at least what i'm feeling isn't and what i'm experiencing is not unusual for the stage of grief that i'm in i'm also learning about different kinds of grief people who have grieved uh who've been grieving ahead of time maybe for someone who's been who they've maybe lost through alzheimer's and so the person hasn't been there and now they finally die or maybe they've been in hospital for a long time. So they've actually been at home alone for long. And so that, that death is still impacting, but there's been a part of their lives that they've grieved already. And so that, that makes a big difference on sort of the intensity in the, in the few months following. Um, yeah. And then, for, you know, for in my case where there was 24 seven caregiving, that's a totally different thing. It's a little bit more intense and, so that not that n none of them are intense they're all intense but just in different ways for me specifically my body really does feel that the the difficulty in leaving the house i struggle with that uh the pathway that my brain built over the last year was you can't leave scott alone so you got to stay home and if you're not going to stay home you have to take scott with you so what happens is i leave the house and scott's not with me so my body says oh oh, oh you got to hurry up and go home because you, f you left scott at home even though my head says, of course, Scott's not there. Scott's in heaven. You did not leave him alone. So there's a lot of like mind work I have to do about getting my body into the place to say, yeah, it's okay to leave and you don't have to rush home. There's nothing to go home for. No one's there waiting for you. And so that's sort of a rewiring after many, many months of having to be home. Um, I do find myself waking up at specific times in the night. Um, I also, part of that could be, those were typical times when Scott and I would have, I were, I would have woken up from Scott getting up to use a bathroom or, you know, perhaps having seizures or issues or things like that. So, um, some of that is, is, is habit that my body or pathways that my body began to uh, be wired for. Um, and so, and some of them I'm, I'm having dreams. Like I just cannot believe I have not dreamt this much in my whole life I don't think and some of them are nightmares and they're not about Scott they're not about anything they're just about really weird random things so uh, again this is just my brain not turning off my brain is trying to still process all kinds of things and so it does it at night uh, that also means that I'm not digesting food very well again this is very common for that like uh, uh, you know that autonomic s s nervous system where it's at fight or flight, um, which is interesting because I had just been explaining that to someone else today and then the counselor or this week and then the counselor said to me, oh yeah, it's that fight or flight. And I'm like, yeah, it feels like my body is like constantly in fight or flight right now. And it's not getting into that like resting mode. So I'm getting there. I'm getting better at that. And um, 
last night is actually I did have a really good sleep. So a few times I have had really good sleeps, but it's not consistent. So I'm getting better at that. Now, what I want to talk to you about today is two things. Uh, a couple of people have asked me, what are you doing to grieve in a healthy way? So some of these things I hope are already answering some of that. But this particular question is uh, interesting. So I have a list of things I've made to do that are very simple, like water the plants, um, make a meal from scratch, um, wash my hair, uh, wipe the patio door windows. I haven't done that one yet. Um, have a Zoom session. Um, I don't know. There's like probably 50 or more things on this list. And so when I have a day that I feel like I just can't get anything done, where I feel like I can't even eat, I just, I'm so tired, I need to sleep. Um, I just look at my list and I pick one thing to do. And usually, honestly, I go to the easiest thing. So, and then I cross it off. So I'm not allowed to use that that easy thing again. So uh, I, I, I have made that list for myself. I've helped other clients of mine prior to Scott passing away. I did work with other clients who were either end of life or th going through grief. And I would help them with a chart that, or a, a list that's similar. And it does help me. It gives me like no excuse. Something has to be marked off. Either I have to be able to check off something that I did well during the day, or if it gets to be like end of the day, four o'clock and I still haven't done anything, I need to do something on that list. So that's been, um, that's been super helpful for me. And it's just really cool how suddenly I feel like, oh, we played game. <laughs> so last night, uh, one of my things was I wanted to spend some time on my deck with my Edison bulbs on. I hadn't been able to do that yet. And so, um, and I also, another thing on my list is I wanted to play a game with the, uh, someone that I support who lives in my home. So last night we turned on the Edison bulbs and sat outside and we played sequence. So I got something checked off my list. So that was a really good thing. But yeah, it's just surprising how um, your the grief is sort of all encompassing at this stage for me. And for years and years, I could not cry. Like I didn't cry for years. Uh, it was only in my, I would say late twenties that I went through some healing and prayer and I was able to cry. And then I felt like I cried for a couple years, but it wasn't like sobbing crying. But if I cried, I'd get a tear or two. And then in the last year, like I'm just not a crier. I, like it's just been interesting. I've never really been a crier. I've struggled because I've sometimes wanted to cry and I haven't been able to. And then I went through a few years where I would cry, but there'd be like no tears. It would just be like sobbing without tears and my tear ducts didn't work and it was just like cranky. And one point I did have someone really frustrated with me that I didn't have tears. And, and you know, there's nothing I can do about it. That's just the way that my body worked, the way I worked. And, um, but now, I'm in a completely uh, different, I need to just decline a phone call here. I'm in a completely different space. It feels like now I cry at the drop of a hat and I cry so many tears, like it's crazy. It used to get like one tear, if anything. Now, like I get a couple tears on both sides and it like fills in this little, these hollows here. <laughs> and so I have like tears and it's just weird. Um, and I never used to cry. Now I cry at everything. So that's, uh, I'm looking at that. I'm choosing to see that as a positive sign. Um, and then um, going through different stages of grief. Now, people talk about the stages of grief and I'm trying to pay attention to them in a healthy way. So this is another one of the things that I'm trying to do to be aware of where I'm at. So I can grieve like a godly, healthy Christian woman. Um, one of the things is that uh, I have felt like you know, there's different stages. There's there's denial, there's anger, there's guilt, there's like depression. There's like, lots of different stages and not everybody goes through all the stages and they don't come in order and they're, they're not linear. It's not like first you do this, then this, then this is just sort of all mixed up. So there is an area that I that I do struggle with anger over and it has nothing to do with Scott actually or myself, but uh, situation outside involving uh, someone and just feeling like angry with how things ended up and how things turned out. Uh, we have had a conversation and we have made it right. So as much as I could, I did what I, I've, I have done what I can to handle that grief. 
uh, or that anger, I'm gonna call it grief because it's anger that comes from grief, feeling very protective over Scott. And so I think I have done everything in my power to clear up what actually needs to be cleared up. And then I'm just gonna count the rest up to grief anger, which means that it may not be, it may or may not be actually anger. It just means that that's the way this feels most comfortable is to come out in anger. So I'm really working on that in this situation. I'm journaling about it, praying through it. And um, uh, we just did have a conversation about that. So we're, I'm working on that. I'm being very, very deliberate so that I'm not holding on to anger so that nobody can, um, uh, nobody, like by nobody, I mean me, nobody can say in my brain, um, oh, look, you're angry about this. So I'm really trying to work on that. Um, the other thing that is uh, interesting is the issue of guilt. So one of the stages of grief is guilt. And I have no regrets or guilt for how we handled the Scott's illness, um, the dying process, the funeral, everything. I'm like, I feel so pleased and happy and proud of how Scott and I together worked through all of those things and were as prepared as possible. Um, so I felt a little shocked when I began to feel this guilt feeling and I had to like really talk it through to figure out what am I feeling guilty about. And it's this, it's how tired I am. I feel like part of the tears. I love Scott and he loved me. We had an amazing marriage. Like I didn't think a marriage could actually be that phenomenal. Like uh, we, we talked through everything. We were like emotionally so intimate and we had such a deep, close friendship. Like we talked till all hours of the night. So it was fantastic. Um, and I enjoyed every moment of our marriage, like right to the end. Like even though in the last week he couldn't respond very well, when he did, it was so sweet. And we had a, like, it was great. Like, I don't know how to say that more than that, but, um, um, but now my body is tired. So for the, the last year, as you probably know, Scott had five surgeries. So that meant that he was on um, disability for much of those. And so there was some caregiving that took place literally from before our wedding right through until he died. And so there were periods where it was less and then there was periods where it was more. Uh, sometimes he was in hospital, sometimes he was at home. But for the most part, that caregiving happened at home. And so um, what happened though is with all of the things that I was doing with caregiving and, and other things that were happening in our life, like, oh my goodness, so many things were going on in our life besides just Scott's health, that it literally felt like Scott would say, he'd be lay in bed and we'd go like, feels like we've just lived 30 years of marriage in one year. And it's like, yep, I feel like we did. So there was like so many things going on. But now I'm exhausted and I feel guilty saying that I'm tired from a year of caregiving and a year of serving. I feel like if I say how tired I really am, that it will somehow mean that Scott was a burden. And I have to tell you that at no point did I ever, 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 did the thought ever cross my mind that Scott was a burden. Like it was, it was a joy. It was an us together to take care of him. And he cared for me through all of that emotionally. And he was so there with it till the very end. Um, I mean, he had confusing points and we, I've told you some of those funny things. Yeah. Um, but, uh, there was, he, we, we were an us right till the end. And so I feel like, I feel guilty saying I'm exhausted from all that caregiving. But the truth of the matter is my body is tired. My body is very tired. I have to relearn how to rest, relearn how to sleep, how to get good rest and good digestion back and uh, a year of caregiving is hard 
And I don't know how Scott did it. He cared for his wife for 17 years. Uh, and I don't know how he did it without uh, coming to the end of himself. But, you know, God was his strength. And God was my strength. And now my body is tired. And so I just have to realize that. If Scott was here, he'd say, of course you are, Carl Ann. Of course you are. Look at, he, even when he was here, he would be like, Carl Ann, look at all, look at how much you, you're doing all day. And he would sometimes feel bad because he couldn't help out. Like for a long time, he would help out with like the, the dishes or sweeping the floor or emptying the, well, he never emptied the dishwasher. He filled the dishwasher or clear off the counter or wipe the table, but eventually he couldn't even do that. And he would feel so bad. And I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. Like really, it's okay. Um, and it was okay and it is okay even now, but the truth is that all of that does take a toll and I am just human. I'm not meant to work at that level for that long. And so I need to, I'm working on getting rid of the guilt that I feel for being so tired after taking care of him. And yeah, so that's one of the stages of grief that I feel like I'm in right now is uh, <clears throat> just being okay with being this tired and knowing that I need to rest and take care of myself and uh, let God take care of me. And a few close friends who check in on me and make sure that I'm okay. So that's good. Love you guys. All right, so that's it. I wanna stop talking about that. <laughs> and then there's another question that um, came up in, uh, like, I'm just so grateful. I love it when you guys ask me questions about grieving or about how to prepare. So I have begun putting things on paper, like what kinds of documents should you have prepared? So in case you or your loved one or one of your loved ones dies, uh, I'm trying to put together some questions to ask if you have terminal, someone with terminal illness or, you know, someone with a prognosis of a short lifespan. Um, I'm starting to put that stuff together. But one person asked basically like, I, you know, they maybe, maybe you're a person who doesn't do all the things in a house and, or in a, running a household. How do you prepare and how do you keep that fear of all the things you don't know to like overshadow even the joy of living when uh, you're both alive, but you know, you know that one of you is likely going to die. So for men, this might be things like, you know, I don't know. I'm going to keep up with all the housekeeping and the house cleaning. I'm not, I've never done that. Or I don't know how to cook. I think once my uh, spouse dies, I might only end up with eating fast food or freezer meals, or I might go hungry <laughs> uh, or eat out all the time. Uh, for a woman, it might be, I don't know what I'm going to do about the, the yard work. or I don't know how to take care of the finances and the bills. And I don't know where all our money is and I don't know how to how to pay all these bills and I don't know what I'm going to do if something should die, if this person should die. So there's all kinds of things and it could include vehicle maintenance, house maintenance, yard maintenance. It could include um, like what, what would I do with a business? All of these things are actually a big deal. And this is where I think it's super important that if you're married, um, give each other access. It's not about someone having control over your things, but one of the things that Scott did that made things so much easier for me, for example, on his phone, I had the password to his phone. I also had like the thumb, um, the fingerprint ID, so that on his apps, we could, I could access them if I didn't remember his passwords or didn't know his passwords. I'd have access to them. So he went through shortly before he died and he put all of the app, all of the app passwords on that they would accept that fingerprint thing. And so that made things super easy because I could go into bank accounts, I could go into apps and cancel them. I could go into subscriptions and cancel them and like all that kind of stuff. So that's one thing that I think if you are married, your spouse should have access to your phone. And not necessarily that they use all the time, but that they could if they needed to. Um, another thing is sit down with each other and have a list. You might want to put it on your phone. You might want to put it on a paper document. You might want to put it on an online document. For us, I've always used Evernote, which is an online document um, protocol. 
So I have everything on there, like my, my passwords, uh, whatever password Scott gave me. Uh, also, all of our banking information, all of the financial institutions, the will, uh, power of attorney, all of the plans, the things that we talked about, um, plans for like, well, what songs do you want for your funeral? How do you want the funeral to go? All of that information we had, and it was a shared document, so we could go back and forth, and um, he could add to it, I could add to it. And so this just makes it super easy at the end. Now, some of people, some people tell me, oh, my spouse doesn't want to talk about death. My spouse doesn't want to have this conversation. Um, I can understand that. And at the beginning, Scott felt that way too. He was not eager to talk about it and he was not eager to plan for it. And, um, Part of it was it's scary to face your own mortality and to like, he kept saying, I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss the kids. I'm like, no, you're going to be in heaven. You're not going to miss us, but we are going to miss you. So you need to get this done because we don't want to, don't make it harder on us once you're gone. So um, we eventually did get to a point where we were able to have these conversations, but it does say it does take one person in the relationship to sort of take leadership of that. And the other person to take some humility and say, okay, you know what? If this means you will feel more loved if we have these conversations, love them enough to do that. And if you're the one who doesn't want to have the conversations, I would say, you know, this is one of the best ways to love your spouse is by having them prepared. I can tell you that Scott and I were prepared to the hilt for what was coming and there are things that have to happen after death that are so convoluted, so much red tape, so much craziness, and um, that your loved one is going to have their hands full with the things that you can't control. So you might as well love them enough to make it easy with the things that you can control. So, um, for example, I'll just give you a few things. We had everything ready, but Canada Post screwed up so many times. The first letter was uh, that he had terminated his employment in 2014, but he did not. The next was he was he had applied for a leave of absence without pay. He had not. Uh, the second one that I was not his wife, that Rhonda was still his wife, but that she wasn't his wife, that she was his niece. So I have to fight that Rhonda's not his niece. And then I have to fight that she's actually not alive. And that I'm his wife. And the another one was uh, that he had so many hours left to submit uh, termination or an exit survey uh, since he was no longer employed with Canada Post. Like, honestly, finally I called Canada Post and said, listen, my husband is dead. This is my fifth time calling. How many times do I have to call you and prove that my husband is dead? So I don't know, we may or may not have finally gotten through to Canada Post, but so far I think we're on track. But these are, this is just one thing. We had a bit of an issue with the bank account. Um, so the executor's taking care of that. But if you can get these things taken care of ahead of time, even to just know where all the accounts are, what all the passwords are, whether there's verbal passwords or um, pat or fingerprint or facial ID, whatever that is, make sure your spouse or loved one has that information. It's actually very, very important. Also, make sure that you're learning and explaining to your spouse why you're making some decisions. So why do we put it into this account and not that account? Why is it in the TFSA, this one, and this one goes to RSP? What happens with this? What happens with that? Have those conversations because Without your information, your spouse may have no idea what to do once you pass away, if you should pass away first. Think about it like this. This has helped Scott, so hopefully it can help you. Uh, Scott drives a spider, now I drive a spider, and it's wonderful. He would go on trips, and so when you go on a trip, you, of course, you check, this, check the weather, you try and plan your trip for when it's gonna be good weather, and then you um, you head out, but you don't just like, oh, weather's good, let's go, put your helmet on and off you go. No, first you make sure you've got gas in the tank, you make sure your oil's been checked, you make sure that your tires are good, um, make sure your headlights are working and your signal lights are working, you do all of those things. You might put 
an extra liter of oil in the in the front or in the trunk, depending on what you have in saddlebag. Uh, and you're gonna pack rain gear. Uh, you're gonna pack a rain jacket. You're gonna pack uh, rain pants, maybe chaps. You're gonna pack gloves. You're maybe gonna pack some heavier jackets if it's gonna be cold. Um, and you don't do all of these things because you hope that it rains and because you hope you break down the side of the road. No, you do these things because you don't know what's gonna happen, but you know the possibilities are there and you wanna be prepared and you wanna be able to sail through them without any issue. And so, loved one, let your spouse be prepared. That means, if that means that you have to show them how to start the mower, maybe it means that you have to get out there and push mow for a while or learn how to ride the riding mower or, or maybe book the appointment to take your vehicle in for uh, repair or maybe you have to learn how to cook a few recipes from a recipe book. Do those things together. Make this an activity that you do together so that you're building intimacy, you're building memories, but you're also teaching and training and handing on that baton. Because honestly, it might not even be death. It might be a stroke. It might be a fall down the stairs. It might be something that happens that takes you out of commission for a while and now your loved one has to do it and you're not even dead, but you're in, a, in able to help them. And so having these things as preparation, this is a way to put your, your rain gear in. This is a way to get the CAA. You, hope you, you buy CAA hoping you never have to use it. But if you do, something happens, at least you have it, you know who to call, right? So have these things, put together a list and do the hard thing of trying. Now, the fact of the matter is we are not all going to be good at everything. So if you are afraid of your husband passing away and you don't know how to do the finances or you don't know how to take care of the yard, or you are afraid of your wife passing away because you don't know how to take you don't want to buy gifts for the grandkids or the kids. Or you don't know how to make the special meals at, at, for family gatherings. Do you know what? That's actually okay. That's actually okay. Do what you can and do what you feel you're comfortable in preparing. But remember this. You can also hire someone to cut the grass. You could also hire someone to weed whack. Maybe there's a family member that can help you out. When it comes to meals... You know, either you can learn how to cook after, or you can hire someone, or you can have it catered, or you can make it a potluck. There's, it doesn't always have to be how it always was. So remember that as you are thinking about whether or not you are ready for your spouse passing away. Uh, you'll never be ready completely, and there's always going to be things that you're like, oh man, I don't know how to do this, I wish I knew. Trust me, I wish, I wish many times so far that haven't had... A, <laughs> A number I could text to say, hey, Scott, I don't know how to do this. So, um, but they don't. There's no no cell number. No one's going to reply. So, um, but I do know that there's things that I'm already doing differently because I have to. I don't have the strength and capacity and the ability to do it the way he did. Um, there's also uh, things that I'm not going to decide about right now. I have to just leave them and decide at a later date. And that's all okay. So be as prepared as you can, but know that when you get as prepared as you can, it still won't be enough. And, um, but the more prepared you are, the easier it will be to transition once you're there. Okay? So I hope that answers some of those questions. Do the hard things, have the hard conversations. I know they're so hard, but it really honestly is the best way to love one another. Um, just knowing that I knew what Scott wanted for the funeral. I knew what he wanted for with the will. I knew what he wanted with, you know, the sale of his house. I knew what he wanted with all these things. Having had those conversations <sighs> gives me a lot of peace now and helps me, uh, even if I make decisions that are slightly different, at least I know we were on the same page and I know we were, where we were going and where we would have been headed right now. So I know this is, again, a long video. I hope that's been helpful. I love answering questions and I love talking about Scott because it brings him close, keeps him here. So please post questions, send me messages. I'll try and keep up with them on here. Thanks.